This is lecture four, uh, chapter nine, moving into the knee, still of module four. So the knee, uh, looking at the knee joint, it uh, is the articulation between the tibia, uh, the proximal tibia and the distal femur. Uh, it includes the patella here, so the patella femoral uh, relationship. And then the fibula, although not directly part of the knee, uh, has quite a bit of musculature that as an anchor point uh, that can affect knee function. So these, it's really the relationship between the, uh, these four bones, but really the relationship here between the uh, femur and the uh, tibia. So the two primary joints that we'll be exploring are the patella femoral joint, so how the patella uh, interacts with the femoral. Uh, the femur and the tibiofemoral joint, so how the tibia plateau represents or uh, interacts with these uh, femoral condyles. And you'll see here, uh, you can see longer, more blown out here, the femur, the tibia, the and this relationship. And then you can see with the muscle attachments that there's quite a bit of musculature that crosses the joint here. This dashed line here represents the joint capsule. That's what's uh, behind the uh, behind the capsule of the synovial fluid, and then quite a bit of musculature um, that plays out here. So you can see, uh, looking here at the distal femur, this is the uh, contacting surfaces. You can see that these condyles, this, these rocker-like aspects are huge, and they slide. And the tibia plateau, the bony part of it, is actually pretty flat, but it has quite a bit of connective tissue here that, um, that acts as sockets for these articulations. And the next slide here kind of shows that a little bit. But before I move on, <coughs> so here we have the, the condyles. This is the contacting surface. These are these large round components. And it doesn't really show here, but in the next couple slides we'll look at it. Let me go back here. Yeah, you really can't see it here either. Um, and then you have these epicondyles that are anchor or attachment points for muscles. So I just pointed these out from a structural component that these condyles and epicondyles, uh, these, the condyles are the moving parts, the articulating surfaces, where the epicondyles act as the muscular uh, attachments. So in this view here, you're, you're looking straight down on top of the tibia, so where you would be if you were the femur. Um, and you can see these uh, meniscus here, and it's these uh, cartilage-like discs that um, increase surface area, kind of like what the uh, acetabulum labor, uh, labrum had, had did for the um, head of the femur, where it increased the contact surface. And you can see that the medial condyle is shaped more like a C, right? This is the bigger of the two and then the lateral condyle is shaped like an O. So here you can see the condyle now, and you can see how big it is. So, like, so here's the diameter of the femur. You can see the condyle comes all the way back and around. And this whole articulating surface um, needs to make contact at some point with that tibia plateau. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing this image without the connective tissue there, and you can see that there's not, not a lot build up. But a normal, um, a normal function here, you would, uh, you would actually have this tissue built up nice like this, though, between those meniscus, and it just increases that contact, that surface area, like almost doubles the surface area, and gives a nice groove for those condyles to uh, slide and rock in. So here's your patella. Here's the outside of your patella. There's the apex, which is the bottom of the patella, and the base, which is the top. And then you can see the articular surface here, and you can see there's two notches or grooves that are supposed to go along the, um, the condyles. And the patella really acts as a anatomical pulley. Uh, it's increasing the lever arm of the knee extensors so that the, uh, so it does two things. It redirects the force, so it's a pulley, so that the, instead of pulling up into here, it's pulling out a little bit. And then it's increasing the distance of the muscle uh, attachment so that it actually gives it about a quarter or a third more leverage there. Um, you can see here's the vastus lateralis and medialis coming down. You can see the patella. You can see the patellar tendon here. Right here is the tibial tuberosity where the patellar tendon attaches and it bumps up a little bit. If you reach down below your knee and you palpate, you'll feel a little bump right there. Um, that is the insertion of all of the quadricep muscles that are converging down and pulling uh, right there. Um, here's your IT band. 
um, that we looked at um, from last unit. And right here is that Pez and Serene. This is where the semitendinosus, the gracilis, and the sartorius are all coming in and attaching at the same spot. So that was that special area that I referenced in the uh, hip -like musculature, uh, referring to these three muscles. So the Pez and Serene tendon, it's the convergence of the semitendinosus, the longer tendon of the hamstring, gracilis, and the sartorius. And then we're going to start introducing these ligaments. And really where the knee gets a lot of its stability from are from this ligamentous structure. And so we'll be talking more in this unit than any other unit when it comes to uh, the passive connective tissue. You can see here the medial collateral ligament and the lateral collateral ligament. And these collateral ligaments are the side ligaments that uh, check motion in the frontal plane. So we, we pull back, we get rid of the, um, we're looking from a posterior view. And you can see here, uh, again, the collateral ligaments. Um, you can start seeing some of the joint capsules and the, so forth. Um, but what I wanted to point out in this image um, is here you have the hamstrings coming down. So you have your semitendinosus and semimembranosus. And here you have the short and long head of the bicep. And they're coming down on either side. That's why these guys are external rotators and these guys are internal rotators. I'm sorry, I got it reversed. Uh, external rotators and internal rotators. But they come down and they cross over the knee and they attach to the tibia. What you see here, these are the gastroc, the calf muscles that are cut. They originate down here and they come up here and they attach onto the femur. And so they create a very large uh, posterior. And they're both, all four of these muscles act as knee flexors. What they do is they create a cross-linked uh, stabilization aspect. So the next image here is like two hands, right? So like these are your hamstrings coming down, crossing the joint and attaching on the tibia. And these are your gastrocs coming up and crossing the joint and attacking on the, on the fibula or on the femur. So they have a, a pretty solid stabilization mechanism here for the back of the posterior of the knee. And all four act as knee uh, flexors. So here's your lateral view. Uh, here's your IT band that's cut. Here's your bicep femoris that's cut. And what you're seeing here are these, this lateral collateral ligament. And you can see the uh, interacting surfaces between the condyles and the meniscus. And then here's your medial view and there's your medial collateral ligament. From the side here too, you can see the pes and serene. Here's your semimembranosus. Um, I'm sorry, uh, semitendinosis. Uh, there's your semimembranosus there. Here's your semitendinosus coming down. And then here's your gracilis and your sartorius cut, and they kind of hit that same area there. So here are your four main ligaments that you should be pretty much familiar with. So you have your uh, both your medial and lateral collateral ligaments. So your side, so your lateral side, medial side, and then you have your anterior and posterior, your ACL, your anterior cruciate ligament and your posterior cruciate ligament. And these four ligaments uh, add stability to the knee and keep pretty much everything in place. Here's the back end of your medial and lateral condyle. Here's your medial meniscus and your lateral meniscus. And um, that's the, this is the track, and these are the rails that keep everything uh, on pace. So here you can see your uh, ACL and your, po your PCL that are cut. You can see that O and D ring here. This is the posterior here. Here's your gastrox, your medial head and lateral head. And then here's your patella and um, your cut lateral collateral ligament and your cut medial collateral ligament. Now the ligaments definitely keep everything in place, but you have such a, you have a large muscular uh, crossing here that you're getting secondary support from the musculature. Although the muscles are the primary, but the ligaments are working in that aspect. So again, you can kind of see here the PCL, ACL. You can see the lateral meniscus. You can see the medial meniscus. Again, this is just redundant images to kind of look at the view. Here you can kind of see the, um, the, the more of a relationship of everything coming together, the ACL, PCL. And um, these acronyms, MCL, LCL, ACL, and PCL, are used often in, um, in vernacular, in industry. So please make sure that you know the ACL is the anterior cruciate ligament, MCL. And uh, the next slide kind of shows that here. The, you know, the lateral medial meniscus, ACL, MCL, PCL, and LCL. So the acronyms are going to be quite involved. So now, the one thing to remember about ligaments is that they're not like muscles. They're not supposed to stretch. They're supposed to resist lengthening. They're supposed to resist tension. Um, the ACL and PCL, I'm sorry, uh, the ACL and PCL aren't immediately um, 
notable, but the, the ACL is supposed to restrict um, anterior translation and the PCL is supposed to restrict posterior. So this is an anterior view looking uh, on. Now, so you're looking at the front and the way the ACL works is it's supposed to, it's going to resist the, the, the movement of the tibia coming forward right because it's it's it attaches back here and it shoots straight back and so it's going to prevent the tibia from coming out from the screen and the PCL it attaches from the back and comes to the front it's going to prevent the tibia from moving backwards into the screen right now if we're talking about the femur the ACL prevents the femur from moving backwards which is the same as the tibia coming forward and the PCL I there's a couple of videos I'm gonna, that I'm gonna have you guys watch and I'll probably show within this lecture that um, <coughs> that um, kind of show some of the functioning. So the, the lateral collateral ligament and the medial collateral ligament, they're going to resist stretching in the frontal plane. So if the knee starts to bow out a little bit, so um, uh, let me, let's pull up the next slide and we'll kind of show how this is happening. So let's look here. If you, if you have someone that presents with a, a lateral collateral ligament tear, just think for a second, which direction was the force or the movement that caused this to over lengthen? So the impact's actually coming from this side. So the impact came here and it caused this to, you know, if this is the movement, it created it created this to lengthen and this actually shortened. So this overstretched, this was it wasn't able, the tissue tension here was greater than the tensile resistance here. And so it, in, it, it injured, or it ripped, teared. How about here, a torn MCL? And you kind of can see the, the bone angle that needed to happen here. You have your impact coming from this direction that tore the MCL. And this MCL tear is, uh, is quite common. Um, in order for an impact coming from the side there, that you have this impact coming in and you're getting this torn medial collateral ligament. It's usually a, a defender or an opponent coming in and your, uh, your athlete is taking a blow to the outside of the leg, this lateral directed force that's pushing here, that's causing this to uh, expand and you're getting damage to that tissue there. So here's a cross-sectional area that allows you to appreciate um, the thickness of the meniscus and how it's increasing that contact surface and you can kind of see the patella and the musculature coming down through there and this bone this femur is stacked right on top of the tibia and um, under normal knee alignment there's an offset at about five degrees and what we saw so this is the uh, right leg here's here's uh, lateral here's medial and because of the loading, because of this offset, the medial meniscus and the medial condyle are, are quite larger than the, um, so if we look back here, you can see that this medial meniscus in, is, is longer and, and bigger than the uh, lateral. And it's because of that angle that we have. Let me just go back to that slide. Do, do, do. Here we are. And part of that is because of this natural angle that we have. So if we were straight up and down, the angle would be 180 degrees. But we're offset about 5 degrees. And um, women, because of the width of the pelvis, tend to be a little bit wider. So their angle is a little bit larger. This angle between the uh, vertical shaft of the tibia and this angle here that's made is called the Q angle. And um, this is referred to as valgus. And um, my next slide here will explain valgus versus uh, varus. But um, you can have too much valgus, too much varus. You can have too much of an angle, too little of an angle. And it can create biomechanical and soft tissue consequences down that. But the most of the majority of the human pa uh, population, most people aren't straight up and down. They have this little bit wider at the hip than they are at the knee. The legs come in a little bit to create that um, loading and stability through the lower extremity. So varus and valgus, uh, this is normal, so a little bit of valgus. Um, varus is where the angle is actually greater, so you actually have space here, too much uh, air or space between the knees. And then valgus, so you have an over-valgus condition, um, you get knock-kneed where the knees are coming in. So um, varus means the distal end of the joint is, me is pointing medially, and the valgus is pointing laterally. Um, in this case, the varus position here is looking at the knee, not the hip. 
Um, so the in this we're looking at the hip, the varus here, the distal end of this um, bone is pointing medial towards midline. It's more medial than lateral, but then it's valgus at the hip. The, the hip, the proximal end is more medial and the distal end is more lateral. And in this case with the valgus position here, uh, at the knee, not the hip, but the um, here the distal end is pointing out, which is valgus, and the proximal end is pointing in. So that's where we're looking at with this. So um, in general, you're not really looking at uh, coxa vera or coxa valgus or the hip uh, vera or valgus. You're usually looking at the knee varus and valgus. So um, just think when you look at varus, if you can see air between the joints, that's a varus position. And if they are stuck together because of the gum, that's a valgum position. So I apologize about that uh, mix up there. So genuine valgum, sometimes referred to as knock knees, that's when it's greater than about 10 degrees. So from the five degrees, instead of being 175, off the 180, you'd be 165. And the bow-legged, um, some people are just naturally bow-legged, or they have some mechanical condition or some spinal aspect that creates this uh, bow-legged position where there's a lot of air between the, um, between the knees. So this is a varus position, this is a valgum position. So those are frontal plane deviations. Sometimes you can see some uh, sagittal plane. So you see a little bit of hyperextension here. Um, and about five degrees hyperextension is normal. If not, uh, you start to get into this hyperextension aspect and some deformities in that component. This is where it explains the varus versus the uh, valgum. So again, here's your valgus position, the knees stuck together, valgum, air position, varus. Um, here with the uh, varus, the valgus position, uh, if you look at the hip, the hip has a varus, while the knees has valgus, while the ankles are varus. So you have to be specific on what you're talking about. But like I said, most times when these varus and valgus positions are being used, um, they're talking about the knee usually and not the hip or the ankle. So the patella is uh, stabilized because it's basically free floating, but it has these medial directed forces from the oblique fibers of the vastus medialis, so the really low fibers of the vastus medialis. Um, it has some structural aspect, and the lateral components are the IT band. And a lot of times you'll get these patella femoral tracking issues where they'll have to come in and do either like a retinaculum release where they cut the medial or the lateral, but um, it's definitely a a uh, tug of war that's happening here and the, the, the knee needs to be able to track appropriately and the fat pad that exists right underneath the patella is one of the most sensitive areas of the body um, very painful and that's why knee replacements are usually very very troublesome for people to recover from and why a little bit of off uh, this off a little bit can create quite a bit of knee issues so this is the Q angle that I was talking about again, where you look at the, the vertical distance, uh, the, vertical, the difference between the vertical angle of the tibia versus the ASIS, so this line right here. And as I had mentioned, uh, your female athletes are gonna tend to have um, larger Q angles because of the width here. Um, they, the females tend to have a, a wider Q angle. And this is some of the argument of why they say that um, women tend to have more issues with um, uh, this injury here where you have this ACL injury because of that increased shearing force from that wider angle. So there's some evidence for that. Um, there's other aspects looking at the male athletes tend to have more robust because of the testosterone presence, have robust connective tissue, more muscular mass to kind of handle that. But um, there definitely is a, a difference between uh, the male pelvis and female pelvis and that extra width at one or two centimeters can um, change the mechanics quite a little bit. So pretty straightforward. Um, definitely review 265 to 270 and make sure you're going through the, uh, the knee ligaments. Make sure you know what the ACL does, PCL, MCL, and LCL. Uh, next lecture when we look at movement, we'll see how those ligaments are really uh, stabilizing the knee to keep that tracking.